Guys, we are back at the Heroes of the Storm North American Regionals. As you can see, we have just watched an epic three-game series between Panda Global and Tempo Storm. Now, Tempo Storm mentioned they thought it might be a 2-0. They were wrong, but they did manage to pull it out at the end, and they will advance. Hi, I'm Anna Prosser Robinson. I'm thrilled to be hanging out with you still here from Burbank, California at the ESL Studios and with you at home watching on Twitch. We're having such a good time already. I've already organized a couple of duets that I'm really hoping are going to happen with the pro players. I have been told there's a low chance, but I still choose to be optimistic and believe. Anyway, my singing talents are not the point. The point is Heroes of the Storm. We've already had some great games. And again, let's look at the schedule. We had Panda Global versus Tempo Storm just now concluded. Tempo Storm did win that match and they will move on in their group. They're gonna stay in that upper bracket. Now we're looking to see Team Neventic and King of Blades Alpha face off to see who will fight against Tempo Storm. Remember though, no one's been eliminated yet, so we're still all happy faces here in the studio. Be sure to let us know who you're rooting for by tweeting with the hashtag HGC. It's been really fun seeing your tweets. So far, someone has asked me, is a hot dog a sandwich on Twitter? They wanted me to pass that on to the players, and I was so mind blown by that that I have not uh, actually asked a player until I've decided what my opinion is. But if you have other questions like that or maybe a little bit more uh, heroes related, please do feel free to tweet those at me and I am happy to pass them on to the players. Speaking of the players, it is time to bring them out onto the stage, welcoming for the first time these two teams. And I am very excited to introduce them. You may have known them previously as Bob Ross Fan Club and they're still painting pretty pictures of domination. It's Team Neventic. Team Neventic, you can see them here flexing their, their move. Zuna, no fashion for him. What, what, Zuna Kenma, they're so lazy. It's one of, no, it's not lazy. It's just <laughs> when you just become Confident? too cool for cool. Oh, I mean, man. it's like, it's one of those hard things where you just like each slowly evolve your esports levels well, till they get that point. They've been on these kind of stages uh, countless times. Years worth point. of being on this kind of stage. I mean, it's just like Zuna has been a world competitor at multiple games across the board there. You see Erho there with the glasses as well and uh, the swagger of how he put them on. But yeah, no, this is definitely a very veteran team, whether it comes from the competitive world or how they play. And it shows in their record. You see eight and oh there, Jake. I mean, yeah, they, they haven't dropped a game yet. They actually won in the first qualifier, clutching without dropping a single map. And then we haven't seen them. They've been able to hide their strats. They've been just in their, their hyperbolic time chamber <laughs> training and preparing for this event. Absolutely. And you see, look at their most picked heroes. It's something that you don't see that much. Uh, the Abathur specifically. Toronto makes a little bit of sense, keep in mind, when they did qualify. Toronto was a very, very influential hero. Uh, when it came to the picks, but then Abathur is not necessarily something you consider a go-to. So uh, it's going to be interesting to see, does that come into play here today with Neventic? Yeah, guys, the Nama brothers not really giving us a whole lot of, uh, of coolness oomph there, but maybe that's just because they stopped leveling. They got so high in levels, they stopped leveling. I like that theory, Dreadnought and Jake. Now, it's time to welcome their challengers. Neventic did qualify very early on for this competition, and the team that they will be facing got in as a last chance. I could say that they were an undisputed underdog, but they are here to show their swagger. Let's see them do it. It's King of Blades Alpha. Well, with qualifier one there for Neventic, these guys, like Anna said, qualified in the fourth and final qualifier. They have so much to prove here on this stage. King of Blades Alpha representing their organization, one of the three teams under King of Blades, they have made it through. Yeah, and they're definitely a dominant group when it comes to the King of Blades uh, group. They, you see the record gonna be 21 and six here. Definitely, as you said, the underdog story, but look at that, most picked heroes, Chen. Absolutely love it. Uh, something that I would consider being a high contestant, possibly a little bit here when it comes to this tournament this weekend, evolving coming from the foreign scenes of Korea, uh, pulling that out from time to time here. Uh, but King of Blade Alpha, I definitely agree with you. They are the ones, they have something to prove here today. They're against uh, what would be considered kind of the most veteran team here other than Cloud9. Yeah. And uh, whether or not they're going to be able to pull away with a win here, I, I believe they're part of the dark arts. I think they can be the dark horse. Wow, that is the bold statement. Can they do it? We'll find out soon. 
Ooh, the dark arts. We need to get maybe some Snape in here. I don't know. I'm liking this dreadnought. I'm liking this feel. And now, as we move into the haunted and eerie magical world of the draft, casters, what do you think is going to happen here? Oh, man. Well, you know, just going back to what Bob Ross Fan Club or now Neventic has done in the past, they're a team that is not afraid to go deep. They will invade <laughs> your jungle, invade your mercenary camps in yeah. almost any scenario, and they just play with heavy aggression. Absolutely. Aggression is the name of the game when it comes to Neventic. One thing that I do think we're going to see a lot of when it comes to these drafts is I still think Zeratul will be a high influence point. Um, I do think Abathur might be something we see if it's a larger end of the map, uh, but a hero that we didn't see so much of the first set that I think will come out a little bit more here is going to be Sonya. I think Sonya is going to be a contention point for both of these teams and how well they're going to be able to use that hero and synergize with her and uh, that she's just a very, very strong one and how well they're going to be able to capitalize is going to be crucial. Yeah, I mean, her heavy initiation, her sustain, her presence in the fight, she's basically a melee assassin. A lot of the times, if you can't get Thrall, she fills a very similar role to that hero. The real thing that I want to be looking forward to is what if we, what if we see the one, the true, the leap? Oh, I, oh, I, I, I'm not, I, I don't think it's, a, yeah, the, uh, I don't know if it's going to be a go-to strategy here, but I definitely, definitely think that it might be something we see pulling out. Like I said, I think this is going to be the evolution of the meta all in one tournament, and I would not be surprised to say that. I, number one, I definitely think Sony is a contestant point. Um, I know that Zuna has loved that hero for a long period of time. It comes, it fits with their play, aggression, beefy front lines, you know, just go in, you invade. Uh, but then also, I do feel like um, both of these teams kind of prioritize her a little bit different than the rest of the scene. The only thing that's cooler than Bloodlust is a washing machine. <laughs> when you pick up the level 20 on the leap for Sonya Absolutely. with the barrel upgrades yep. on Chen and you just go around like a washing machine within the crater. That's you're not wrong. That is, there is nothing cooler in the game no. other than that. Um, uh, the washing machine is a decent strategy, except the problem with it is you have to get to level 20. And it turns out there's 19 levels before that at the professional oh, level are really, really relevant. They sadly. should fix that. They, they should level one talent. Exactly. Just you should honestly, it should be like a Cho'Gall pairing. You pick Sonya and instantly you get Chen, and then it's just like level one. The washing machine was born. I want to play that, <laughs> I mean, yeah. even if I could have a custom mode where I just get that. But realistically, though, I mean, we're going to see a lot more prioritization of Falstad. We haven't seen Falstad yet today. We've seen him banned, yes. but we often see McIntyre playing a lot of Falstad. Yep. He's, only does he have crazy presence for those tall maps where he can fly in and really make those big, you know, just kind of be there at a moment's notice. But he's also like just the mighty gust that we see, aggressive mighty gust, flying yes. into position to push the enemies into a corner with big follow-ups from heroes like Jaina. I've seen him do crazy things. I know. I definitely agree with you there. I think that is going to be a very good contestant point, and it's a hero that they definitely like to pick up on. Um, I think we will see maybe a little bit of stitches, stitches dancing around for both sides. Tassadar as well will be a heavy influence. There's not going to be anything really that crazily different. The only one that I might be looking out for here is going to be Chokal. I think that might be something that we um, will see kind of Neventic specifically kind of gravitate towards at any time that they can. So. All right, well, we'll be finding out very soon. We are setting up for the draft in this first game for the best of three series, and it looks like our battleground is going to be Blackheart's Bay. That and is interesting. You know, we were just talking about Falstad. We yeah. were just talking about their ability to dive, and this is like one of the most memorable situations where I've seen Neventic yeah. go deep. I mean, just the, the top bruiser camp on the left side and oh, baiting... Yeah. You can, you can time it with the mini wave to yep. where you can invade it to where they have no idea to see you as long as you stay low and you let the mini wave through go through because the mini waves mirror each other, right? So right. if you can see your mini wave, you know that theirs isn't going to be there. So then you kind of just like sneak on through and then you just get in a night camp and just be like, hey, guys, uh, we're here. And you're all because if that early in the game, it's going to lead to like very easy picks. So, yeah, no, Neventic definitely capitalizing wherever they can. Aggression, aggression, aggression. They absolutely love it. Um, so, yeah, I and when we were talking about Sony and a little bit of the kind of the melee assassins this map is one that definitely accents that style of play kind of uh sitting there jungling if you will and uh looking to capitalize all the coins make it national bank of sonia and eventually get a turn in for a win yeah so i mean other than falstead who else is really highly prioritized what about abathur you think abathur has a strong presence here on this map he has a decent one when it comes to this map he does struggle a little bit when it comes to early game but later in the game uh he can be terrifying if your core turn or your team dominates the coins it allows Avatar to get it a lot of split pressure on the map especially 13 and 16 with that kind of locus oriented build and it's something that is very very hard to deal with you're stuck at a point where you go well we'll just fight him at the turn in and then Avatar goes um i'm just gonna split push top and then you go okay we'll just back in and clear top and then he goes well then we'll just turn in four versus five it's so hard to deal with that kind of strat and with fan being a phenomenal Avatar player i wouldn't be surprised if we saw that come out 
Well, Abbott, they're a potential. Another hero could be ETC. Yeah, I think I think he will be a contestant point. I don't think he will be a unique one or higher or lower for any reason when it comes to the specific setup. I definitely think we'll see play. He's one of the best heroes in the game, without a doubt, when it comes to the tank role. Um, I just don't know if I think anybody will be like that sweet stage dive like strategy or anything else. Um, I think a, a Diablo will be something we might see specifically. Um, when it comes to the King of Blade uh, style play, I think it's something that works with their style of play a little bit more uh, than some of the other teams. And I think Greyman. Greyman. I, I, not so much just with Koba. I think it would be for almost every team. I think Greyman's going to be a hot topic, I would argue, for almost the entire tournament. I don't think he'll be 100% play, but I definitely think he's going to be a hero that we see teams kind of go, like, you act like you forgot about it, and they lock it in, and it just ruins the draft. And you're like, wow, they just won so hard. So what is Brightwing's power on this map, too? You think there's, there's a little bit more room for Brightwing to be yeah. played here? I mean, she's obviously picking up room in the meta, but you, this map, is it, is it the tallest map in the entire game? Um, I believe it's the second most. Next to Sky I, Temple? You, uh, I, I would actually, I think the, I don't know, actually. I don't know what the most vertical map. It might be BHB. I, that's BHB. a good question. I, I have to test that out. That's I, I don't honestly know, but it is really um, influential when it comes to how the map's going to be played, especially, like you said, globals are very, very valuable because it, it's kind of the same Abathur problem, right? Um, if you can't get, if you have the coins on your side, then Brightwing's just going to go, okay, with that Arcane Flare, getting that extra C, out split pushing the best you can you're like respond to brightwing and then she just goes i mean i'm really good at murder and then just teleport in and then proceed to either take a four versus five or you give up a free turn in which is debatably harder to deal with in the bright brightwing split pushing in the first place well brightwing everyone's favorite fairy dragon let's take a look at a hero spotlight for brightwing and brightwing she looks cute but she's vicious <laughs> she's terrifying. And when you play her, you just question like your own sanity sometimes. You're like, oh, this is an adorable voice. And then you're just like, wait a minute. This is this is pretty dark. Yeah, it is. Man, I miss Emerald Wind so much. Oh, yeah. And it's, I mean, it's not that it's completely gone. It's just it doesn't really fit what is the optimal level of play with. She just struggles at being a healer of any kind at that point. You're like, if you're picking Brightwing for the sake of an Emerald Wind, you might as well be picking something like ETC. He provides an equal, not equal, yeah. but close to equal AOE CC, debatably a little bit better, and light AOE healing with that groupies oriented play. Like, it's just she struggles on so many fronts that that blink heal is almost necessary for her, which is kind of why she gets paired even with that with double healer sometimes. She just isn't necessarily the best healer in the game, but she is very versatile in play styles. So beyond the global presence in Heroes, beyond Greymane being highly contested, where do you think Chogall fits in this map, right? And just in this map in general, it's a very tall three-lane map. Yeah. You're giving up a body to pick up Chogall, so it makes it a little bit more you know, complicated to make sure you, you maximize your soak. Do you think he's at all viable here? I, I don't think there's a map that I would say Chogall is not viable on. I think he is a strong enough hero that I would say he has viability in a lot of areas. I just don't know if I would say he excels, um, largely because of that rotational disadvantage. Right. If uh, With the larger maps, if a opponent is going to take a heavy or split push oriented composition, the two-man force rotations that he draws, much like Abathur, suffers from the same thing, where they just have to kind of overcommit resources to one section to defend a split pushing composition, and then you can capitalize somewhere else on the map with then taking front walls. That, if you can manipulate that even harder to get a bigger X lead over your opponents, you can essentially snowball into winning a game. Now, let's talk about Fan very quickly. You see him on screen. This guy has made quite the name for himself. He has. Champion of Heroes of the Dorm. Champion of BlizzCon 2015. No one else has titles like that that they can show. No, he is hands down the most like well-decorated Heroes of the Storm player uh, debatably, well, actually ever. So interesting because ever since we saw Fan traded for Arthlon between Cloud9 and Eventic, yep. a lot of people said, you know, this might take away from their aggressive style because Arthlon fits just, you know, a standard standard ranged assassin, right? Yep. And he works well. But Fan, with that Apther, giving so much more of kind of this control, omnipresent style of yeah. play to the team has lended to their strength so much. I, I, I agree with you. I think more than anything, what it's done is kind of, it hasn't taken away from their ability to be aggressive because I definitely think the remainder of the players love that aggression. What it's done has kind of been like that beautiful balance, yeah. you know, the yin and yang. He's like, wait a minute, guys. What if we just the kind yin of- yin and yang. His like, name is Fan Yang. Yeah, you need to stop. Got him. <laughs> Anyways, it's one of those situations where it's just like, it's like very much like, he can dictate the pace of the game through wave manipulation, um, through soaking and everything else. And it doesn't even have to be on Apathur. He very much is the 
really great balance to the aggression that exists within <laughs> the event. I'm still I'm so tilted. I, I'm so I'm, tilted. I'm, I am max tipped after that one. <laughs> I can tell you that. All right. Well, King of Blades Alpha really getting their focus on. But you can see the you know lighthearted the the, the the giggles that turned into strain. Oh my goodness! He realized he's on stage here trying to qualify for the World Finals. Yeah, and I mean that's a team that most likely this for a lot of the players is going to be their first link. Koba has a lot to prove here. Um, but I think they have it. Like I said, I feel like they, if I was going to give a credit to any team here as what I think would be the most impressive showing from a team that we would consider to be not the, the kind of the veteran um, overlords of the scene that have been kind of hanging around for a long time, that's the team I give it to. I'm going to give a shout out to, to my buddy Vivi. He was the admin there on the side of Noventic. Mm -hmm. I've worked with that guy for like eight years now, Dreadnought. It's a small world here in the esports industry. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, man. Uh, yeah, no, but uh, a lot of it, I think, like I said, I feel like the pick bands for these two teams are going to be interesting. I do I do think that Neventic will go out of their way to not show anything. Oh, yeah. So I think you might see them. Um, Chen, uh, you might see them. I hope so. Uh, you might see them uh, do something. Just, you know, they just don't want to. They even, I mean, heck, they might even Chen have it there. They could Chen Illidan. They could go Undying Comp. That was an old school strategy. The, 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 one of the original two arc versions ran yeah. that about eight months ago you just sit there you, you drink your brew you keep those shields up and abther hat just pokes you down and they've actually buffed symbiote since that style has been in play yeah and with the, the you know the less priority on stuns like gravity laps in the meta that only helps chen be more viable because his biggest weakness is having his trait the the chug uh be interrupted because that will disrupt his ability to really sustain uh, but a, a nice small indirect nerf to Chen, I would say, is the amplified damage the towers now do to heroes. Back in the day, Chen would really just walk up to the towers and drink. And that's a little bit more punishing if he's ever caught out. Yeah, no, it definitely is. He is a, a hero that definitely has a spot in the meta, but where is... Uh, right, it's right. Very, it's very <laughs> hit or miss. Kind of kind of like some of the other picks that we've seen, though. Um, a lot of the picks are not... No longer is the game kind of universally strong picks are what dominate the draft. It is very uh, niche and calculated picks at every point. The priority is, um, honestly, it's it's beautiful to watch the scene kind of develop the way that it has recently here. I mean, even to the point where I wouldn't be surprised if we even saw something like a murky, I mean, Vikings, ooh, like, I ooh, mean, it's about my. to get real in the Whole Foods parking lot. I mean, oh, <laughs> it's going to go down and we're going to save some dollars. Whole Foods has great prices on, on pasta. I'm not going to do a call out to Whole Foods. <laughs> so, guys, just another bit of a, a uh, shout out to Blizzard and Twitch for making it all available to get a new portrait in the game by connecting your Battle.net ID to your Twitch account. Go to your Twitch account settings, link your Battle.net ID, and you can get yourself a free portrait just from tuning into the stream today. I, I mean, it's awesome. I, I, I did it myself personally because I wanted to get a part of that sweet, sweet portrait. Sadly, I won't be changing it. I, I'm one true Abathur portrait. I, it's the only way to go for me. You but were telling I mean, me about this, that it's, yeah. it's because it's just... I, I just like the symmetry of it. I found it appealing. The reason I started playing this game was because Abathur. I saw his kit, and I was like, a MOBA with that kind of stuff going to it? Like, what? And then You know, that, that's like, the cool thing about Heroes of the Storm, because a lot of people have told me the same thing about Cho'Gall. Yeah. They heard about Cho'Gall, and they just they just get together with a buddy and try the game out, and Cho'Gall being free, you know, when he was released during the, the plague of Cho'Gall, as I like to call it, because it just spreads from one person to yeah. the next. Uh, they're definitely a big draw to a lot of people. Mm -hmm. No, it very much is. The, the the creativity of the kits are absolutely a selling point when it comes to a lot of these heroes, and it's what drew me. And then that mixed with, the, I just find his entire, like, just, like, logical decision. <laughs> like, that whole thing about him is really sweet. I've always I've always appreciated about them. So uh, mm -hmm. he is my one true portrait. But, yeah, you guys can get your own portraits. But we see we're about to get a draft rotating in here. Neventic versus King of Blades Alpha. Uh, right out the gates, Thrall ban, and then moved into a Rhaegar ban on the part of that Neventic. Man, why does everyone hate orcs? <laughs> going to be looking to get that first pick here. I, I honestly feel like they can take this a lot of different ways. I'm not even going to begin to try and calculate a lot of what Neventic's draft's going to be because I feel like they are going to be hiding yes. as much as they I possibly mean, can. We, we can't dodge around the fact that this is the team that qualified in the first qualifier yes. versus the team that qualified in the fourth qualifier. Absolutely. So generally speaking, that's first seed versus fourth seed. Yeah, or, I you mean... Know, 
and it goes past that too. Well, like just experience within Heroes of the Storm competitive scene, yes. just competitive gaming overall. There's a lot of advantages going to be sitting on the side of Noventic. But like I said, don't count out King of Blades out. No, here. definitely not. Definitely not. Um, well, we do see Zagara picked up very er early. You know, just strong. You want that very powerful solo laner to throw in the bottom lane. Yeah. Zagara, she can creep up all the vents, all the, the flanks that exist in that lane, and safely control the entire space. Yeah, with the removal of Thrall, it makes him her even a more Ooh. dominant pick up there. They do see Lunara right out the gates. This makes me excited and also fearful. I feel like if they do not understand exactly what they're going to try and make happen within the rest of this draft, that they might be very heavily punished by Noventic, but they could have a beautiful pocket strack out here. Like, oh, remember, man. they're considered the underdogs. They might right out the gates just say, you know what, we're going to hit you with something you don't expect. Yeah, it's true, and they might be mixing things up. What will that next pick be? I mean, there's a lot of big options. Falstad, we talked about his power, Tass. but they're going to go for Tassadar. So Noventic, McIntyre could be on that Falstad. They could give a Zuna Zera tool. They could give... Uh, a number of things to their team that would just be incredibly I, I think Zeratul, powerful. I think Zeratul or Sonya, something of the like. Um, I, I I think that there's no chance that they give both of those up here, but I guess that's me saying I wouldn't predict the draft because they're going to hide things, but then <laughs> predicting it, um, I just feel like a melee assassin to deny kind of... Uh, Zeratul is going to be a little bit hard into the Tassadar, but it is a good uh, counter into the Lenara. But again, I think Sonya is a really good hot topic here when it comes to their draft. Oh. And there it is. Sonya is going to be locked in. Man, I cannot um, do that, that battle cry as well. Well, Gilly does it perfectly. Does she lay it down? I, man, it's flawless. I mean, I don't, I don't doubt it. I wish I could. And then we do see uh, what are they going to rotate the rest of this draft into? I don't think Falstead will be the go-to. It, it could, it could be. Oh. It's going to be the lead meeting. Okay, I like that pick far better on their side. Um, and they got a lot going for them in the remainder of this draft. Their pick ban from this point out. I think they're going to be prioritizing um, etc wherever possible. Uh, they also, like I said, etc is going to be banned out there though. So Kings of Blade Alpha, that. Ban right there. We saw Temple do that in one of the drafts earlier. They are saying we have a type of hero, like a tank, that we want to be picking up. When no team has the tank and they ban it and they have the first pick rotation, and him being one of the most dominant tanks in the game, they have an idea of what they're looking for. And I think that's crucial with that first pick Lunar. Uh-huh. Well, Team Neventic doesn't want to worry about the big global presence of Abathur, so they opt to ban him out here. A very powerful hero here on uh, Blackheart's Bay. Now, King of Blades, they need to consider what do they want? Do they want that Muradin for one of those big warrior options, or do they go for Stitches with the vision of Tassadar? Yeah, I, I honestly don't know what they're going to move in this situation. I think a melee is what you would expect, but then they've... Uh, I think Zeratul is like kind of what they would go to. Um, it's just... I don't know if they're going to be able to walk away with it and make very good successful decision making I guess it's kind of hard to play into a Sonya um, in the Zag and I guess a lot of that could just comes down to how confident I am and like the skill level in the Ventic I just feel like Zeratul is very it has to be played almost perfectly to make a lot of big plays here but it could be what sets them apart in this game all right, well, they're thinking about that last Brightwing. pick. They go for Brightwing. Brightwing, Tassadar, the double heal combo, and the global presence of that hero can have a huge impact. Noventic might want to grab Falstead as a response. I, I I think with the three ranges going to be picked up, I do, or not ranges, but DPS, I don't think there's oh, yeah. a chance. You're I, right. Yeah, they're You're just right. going to lock in a war, Single yeah. Sonya Warrior? Yeah. yeah the, new, the new meta. <laughs> Honestly, they could. I would not be surprised if they risk it. <laughs> I want to see them pull out Chen. Personally, I would like to see Chen, and I would like to see... Do we get our washing machine dream, mm, Dreadnought? Oh, jeez, please. No, I, I, I don't know if it would be the washing machine more so. I think I would like to see uh, kind of a, a different tank pull away from the standard there. A Chen... Okay, they're gonna jo go with the JoJo. They aren't gonna take any risks here. Okay, uh, okay, the go Diablo, with the JoJo. Diablo babes. They got all three of them. Yeah. Oh they no, do. where's where's Vala? That's I'm so sad now. Where are you she at? She got left out. I don't know, man. Uh, last pickup here coming out for them support. is gonna be the support. What Karazine? do we think? Karazim. Karazim's a very comfort pick there when it comes to Kenma. Great Karazim player. I wouldn't be surprised if they decided to go with somebody else. Medic as well. Medic is one of the other ones I would be willing to consider. Or we've seen responses from teams going Malfurion as an answer to Lunara. Both of those mm. teams losing. I don't like it, but I wouldn't be totally surprised by it. Personally, I would like to see them go with, okay, they're going to lock in the Uther. Um, I like that pairing. It's going to work well with the Sonya, provide a lot of DPS and hard engage there. It's going to be a good soft counter to uh, the Brightwing as well. Um, trying to polymorph out the Sonya, let's say, cleanses down, for instance. You're going to have the D shield. She's still going to be able to spin to win, heal it up really good there. And then what is the lap pick uh, here? I personally think it's, I don't know. Is it's it's, it's got to be Falstad or Zeratul. Huh. I okay. don't. I. It, they need a sustained kind of DPS or something. They need something big. Could right? Illidan work in this situation? I it, mean, this, there's a lot of stuns. It's kind of risky, isn't like, it? Like they, it, it's an option. Do I think it's the right one? I don't know. It's a good map for Illidan. It's a great map for Illidan. I just 
don't think you are Illidan and Sonya, like Sonya eats Illidan alive. True. Like she just crushes them. Okay, they're gonna go with the Gray Man. I, I expect the Zerato to come into play when it came to this draft here somewhere. Uh, the Sonya that I did uh, think that these teams were gonna prioritize did actually happen, but um, other than that, all right. Catching me off guard, I did not expect that to come out from these team, com uh, team comps here. Very We're interesting to see Zeratul just make it through an entire draft like this. I mean, quite often, Zeratul has he, a huge he, impact. He does, he does. I, and like I said, it comes down to like the diversity of the meta that exists right now. It's like not every pick is like universally strong picks. It's just like a very well calculated rounded thing. And that's what's coming into play here. I don't know if I think Greymane is the answer. I feel like their early game is so, so crippled on mm. King of Blades Alpha right now. It's like when you think about, well, uh, all right, level five, level like five through 13, you're going to skirmish into Neventic. How are you going to win these fights? You don't. You yeah. just try. <laughs> you just try to split soak. So that's why I'm worried. Like Lunara has a great heal, a great character. Awesome. Tassadar is not the best DPS by any means, um, and any front really. And then you see you have uh, the Greymane who spikes really hard. He does okay. He does okay, but he's no Sonya. I mean, you want to go wolf form into there, and she's gonna look at you and be like, oh yeah and just kill you. <laughs> like, you don't even have to leave. She's just gonna look at you, give you a stern look, like raise that one eyebrow, and just be like, nah, dude, just like. Just stank and you ruin your day. The, exactly. The I mean, that, that seismic slam absolutely hurts uh, with Wrath of the Berserker and everything else. So, so expect a lot of aggression out of Neventic in the early parts of the game, just yeah. because the, I, the I think I think one through nine, it's not even really close. A lot of it's going to come down to Brightwing soaking, and then past that point, I think one through thirteen, Neventic has a very strong composition. Post sixteen, I think both teams are roughly on even footing, and it comes down to skill um, at that point. Uh, uh, but I feel like because one through thirteen is so uh, heavily won, in my opinion, by Neventic, that I f I'm afraid that they won't be on even footing to where 16 doesn't Especially matter. when you consider the fact that it's all about rotating around, collecting those coins. But we do see the teams, the players have chosen their heroes. Fan going to be on Lee Ming, Kenma playing Uther, Zuna going to be on that. Sonia, McIntyre on Zagara, and Urho for Johanna for Team Neventic. And then we're going to see uh, on Kings of Blade Alpha, Talking Trees will be playing the Tassadar. Killusion will be playing the Muradin. Dark Camaro will be on that Brightwing. Frozen X is going to be on Lunara. And Tomster is going to be on the Greymane. He is definitely a player to be looking out for when it comes to their composition. He oh. is a very, very great player and a great Greymane. Alrighty, guys. Well, game number one on Blackheart's Bay has begun between Team Neventic, Neventic and King of Blades Alpha. We are loading on in here on the blue side. We have Neventic. Rocking a Cloud9 mount. Nice. Someday nice, we'll nice. have mounts for everyone. I, I, mean, I mean, I I, I I want one. I want a, a mount like that. I mean, hello? Could I win Worlds, <laughs> please? Good luck, man. Being a caster, winning Worlds, it's going to be tough. Yeah, I mean, he's representing his own mount, too. I can respect that. So they are going to be looking to get this skirmish here up in the early part of the game. Um, honestly, level one, we talked about it a little bit here. Tassadar and Brightwing together, like, if they get a little bit of pick uh, in isolation, they're going to be okay. But keep in mind, this is a four versus five. King of Blades Alpha full yeah. rotating here. Zag's going to get free creep down there. Yeah, going to really solidify her position in the bottom of the map. Zagara just kind of making sure she has as much control, controlling the bottom vents, now moving up and actually getting that creep to her near where the chest will spawn. And now the bottom. There will be a rotation. It's going to be Brightwing uh, trying to lean against Zagara. She doesn't do that bad. Uh, keep in mind, both these scenes didn't clear the upper wave first. Zuna now going to rotate up that. The chest will be spawning at 50 seconds, but Brightwing can heal pretty well, right? She does lose the lane overall, but she doesn't, like, get bullied out of it like most heroes do. So now the early rotation, Neventic having a three-man rotation here. A little bit of the XP being met. Neither team capitalizing on that. Bottom strike will go to the Zgara, but up here, that's a pretty good skirmish here. Neventic really walking away with big win. Spin oh, to win there. Man. A really good job taking that. And again... It comes down to that early game story we were talking about, right? Have you, I mean, uh, look at the bottom half of the map. Uh, McIntyre walks away with four. On the upper half of the map, we see they walk away with five more. So now nine coins out of the ten that were available were picked up uh, by Neventic. And you're going to watch Zuna just kind of dance around the map a lot of it. And he's going to be trying to get a lot of these camps that are going to spawn at the two-minute mark, right? He's going to collect them all and then get a little bit of a turn in. If you have the coins on this map, you dictate the pace of the game. And you're going to watch Neventic really try and capitalize on that here. All right, just getting an update there in the bottom lane. Zagara is already starting to push into the towers versus Brightwing. We do see that and the big siege here in the mid from Li Ming. But you can see that half the ammunition is gone on both of these towers. And the problem is going to continue to persist as long as Brightwing's here. Sure, the self-pulse healing will keep Brightwing from dying as long as she plays safe. Yeah. And uh, But 
the, you know, the issue is that they need rotations, they need to respond to Zagara, and here it is. Absolutely, it's one of those situations where they just don't have like the laning presence here, and I feel like a lot of it is just kind of their comp decision. Like it started from honestly the Lunara pick, in my opinion, and a lot of it there the front wall. Now, what that front wall means uh, for the Neventic is when they turn in, it will 100% ensure the fact that that fort falls, and there will be no opportunity to mule. Tassadar having the opportunity to pick up that mule and heal it up there as best as possible. But then look at that isolation, trying to get on these camps. Zuna and Kenma both zoning out here. That's what I was talking about. Zuna just wants to pick up all the coins. He knows if he gets the coins, he dictates the pace of the map. All right, Fan having to teleport to safety. The heals were there from Kenma. Nicely done. But Grammy starting to chunk out that damage. Kenma getting very low. The Ancient Spear from Zuna to try to back away. But Kenma does end up falling. The first death of the game. Now Zuna very low. Four gems will be dropped there. But the pull in with the towers in range. And the big orb goes out and takes out Brightwing. That was huge on their part, honestly. They didn't walk away with any of the coins, really. I guess a few of them, they walk away from having one to now five coins going to be sitting in favor of King of Blades Alpha. So that was really big on their part. But to look at the bottom lane, one turret is going to be lost at this point. No ammo whatsoever either. So they're in a Ooh. situation to where they have a very, very large advantage over their opponents. Um, Neventic still their game to kind of lose at this point. But that was definitely a misplay, a little bit over aggressive here. Yeah, um, from good, them. Good capitalization there by King of Blades Alpha. Just those early kills, it's a confidence booster as well for them. That's for sure. Teams very even in XP, actually dead even at level six so far. And looking at the builds, we are seeing a bit of a mix up. No perfect aim here for Greyman. Gonna just opt to try to keep up that Berserk as often as possible. Full face shift build for Brightwing. They want to have that peekaboo for the vision. And this allows Tassadar to not have to spec into Oracle. He can go for that uh, Leeching Plasma at level four. Yeah, and it's a lot of it's going to come down to, like I said, this early game. I want to see uh, Neventic try and concentrate turn-ins a little bit earlier than they have been. You see Sonya trying to get that night camp there. She's very good at that, and that's exactly what we were talking about. Zuna is going to be the national bank of Sonya this game, ladies and gentlemen. Mm. Leeming getting great harassed there, fan doing a good job. And it's just going to come down to poke, 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 and then try and turn in whenever you can, never risking anything. Um, and that early fight was a little bit of showing that they risked maybe a little bit too much, but they didn't lose enough to really set them that far behind. It's 15 to seven in the coin count, Jake. Yeah, it's very much in favor of, almost, I mean, over a double here for Team Neventic. But Brightwing does have Giants helping push out that bottom lane. The second spawn of the chests is upon us. And it look, looks like Neventic will be in position first for the top chest. Yeah, and Zagar is trying to capitalize on that bottom chest there. Collusion is going to rotate down, and on the upper half, they are going to just walk away with that chest as quick as they possibly can. It's a situation where they're losing kind of on all fronts here when it comes to Collusion. They aren't, or uh, not Collusion, excuse me, King of Blade Alpha. Zuna is going to try and posture up for that turn in along with Urho. This will be a 2v1 situation. He'll get the delay, and the teams will try and make a rotation here. But I wouldn't be surprised if Ventic, yeah, he's not going to risk a little bit too much. Uh, but now that their opponents do have 10 to turn in, that turn in and who, how they fight around it's crucial. Keep in mind, if the turn-in happens, um, uh, King or Neventic's going to get a full fort, but King of Blade Alpha will not. So that XP will be really heavily spiked. Look at the difference in efficiency of Greyman versus Sony trying to get a mercenary camp. I mean, Greyman was just getting bullied by the bruisers. And uh, we do see Brightwing having to face shift in. Now, the, we do see Peekaboo just kind of giving vision on, but Zuna is there. The Ancient Spear connecting, forcing out that Polymorph. That leaves Muradin very vulnerable. Dwarf Toss has been cast. The shields from Tassadar and Collusion able to back on out. That was one of those situations that you were talking about that night camp that Thompson was working on on that gray main. What that did is you saw kind of that dance around where nobody was willing to do anything, that little bit of a posturing here and there on the side of Neventic. The minute that was capped, they recognized there was not going to be a full 5v5 fight, and Zuna gets an aggressive flank positioning. That is the difference between a mid-level and a top-tier level play. Like, they understand they are not together, capitalize and push as hard as you possibly can. Neventic, again, showing why they are considered one of the more dominant teams here at the, uh, at the Spring Championship here. Dominant or not, this is a huge push in the top lane with the Knights. They take out the wall and they actually get through half of the health bar of this fort. So it is a big win here for King of Blades Alpha to really stay on par in experience. But with that siege of Blackheart just shredding through the mid fort and taking it out, Team Neventic now has level 10. Absolutely. Not only do they have level 10, they have coin advantage as well. The skirmish in the mid lane, not going to be anything too crazy here, but they have a lot of coins sitting on Zuna once more. You're going to see him try and lock in a little bit of the more coins and then try and force the turn in again. And because the structures look at bottom, almost a loss of the entire front wall, mid four completely down, top front wall already done. Every turn in on the side of Neventic is going to be far more valuable than on the side of King of Blade Alpha. It's much like Sky Temple, right? For every structure you gain outside of the turn in, it snowballs harder and harder. The only difference is the XP gets higher 
higher and higher, but collusion oh. there. Sonya getting very aggressive. Yeah, there. Izuna is going in, decides to back away. The Force Wall has been cast, and the Maw just to ensure the death of Tassadar. A big pickup. They're stealing some gems in another full turn in. They've got 22 gem or coins right now, Dreadnought. Absolutely, and it, it's essentially what you saw at the beginning half of this game. They're going to push even harder and harder. So they're going to rotate bottom. They're going to take the four. They're going to try and force this four versus five. If they don't manage to get this, they're going to say, okay, that's fine. We have so many coins, we're going to back out, and we're going to turn in again. And now you're going to see this is the snowball of Blackheart's Bay. You get the coins, you dictate the pace of the game, you never risk anything. The talent tier advantage will slowly creep in here in favor of Noventic, and it's all come down to the advantage that they manage to get in the laning phase and the really heavy jungling-esque style play yeah. you see from Zuna. And I, I love what Erho is doing. He's soaking two lanes at once. He's controlling this watchtower. Sure, we did see Lunar was able to take out that top four, which is a nice small victory for King of Blades Alpha, but Erho is just keeping the XP flowing at maximum potential. Yeah, and it's now a situation, look at that, uh, Neventic about to hit 13 tier advantage. So now what they're going to do is try and force the turn in. If their opponents decide to take this turn in, they're going to force the fight. If they don't stop the turn in, then guess what? You got to turn in for free. And now because <laughs> of all those structures, uh, if you, I don't know if you looked around oh. the map, but can you point out a King of Blade Alpha Fort for me really quick? Uh, no, they're, oh. they're, they're not oh, there. Oh, as a matter of fact, they're all gone. They've been they deleted from the game. Eight minutes into the game, about to turn in and threaten to keep front wall already. Okay. Neventic hugely. Erho looking for the flank collusion. Does he have Dwarf Toss? We do see Disintegrate doing a Good bit of damage in the Ancient Spear follow-up, but the Force Ball is on point there. I, it's just, it's a situation where, yeah, they get the Force Ball and they survive, but it's like, what did you, like, congratulations, you didn't fall farther the behind? There comes going to be another <laughs> turn in on your side. The 13 tier advantage is going to be in favor of them, so That's now they're going to wait it out. So, yeah, there's another turn in, so now this turn in is going to be threatening. The front wall on the keep is already gone, uh, in case you didn't know that. So now they, we are threatening a keep already on the side of Noventic. Eight and a half, wait, eight, nine almost minutes, nine yeah. minutes yeah. into this game. Now look at Zuna. He's not hesitating. He's going back. Guess what? He's going to start jungling. The coins are all that matters, and they're going to dictate the pace of this game. Oh, Noventic. no. Brightwing being caught out here in the bottom. Bottom. There's no target that's blink kill range quite yet. Body blocks are great from Kenma. The Hammer of Justice not going to go out, so Kamara manages to get on out. Yeah, he does survive, but it's not going to be still a pretty picture painted here on the side of King of Blade Alpha. Only a level lead disadvantage. The coins are going to be sitting heavily in their favor at this front, but now they're losing another front wall on the bottom half of the map. This is what we were talking about. A keep is already down. Oh, Jake. Zuna taking a lot of damage. Brightwing face shifting in. So much points in there from Lunara. The Ancient Spirit not going to be enough to save Zuna, and he does fall. This time around, he has no coins, so it's not the biggest of deals, but that does get King of Blades Alpha level 13 to try to stabilize in this game. That's a situation where they did make a a pretty big comeback, but not because of the pick there, but mainly because the chest spawned at the exact same time. Mm -hmm. Really well done on their part. Not only did, uh, but they didn't capitalize on the chest. They only got one of the two there with the kill advantage. So they do get a pretty big lead uh, considering how far behind they were. Yeah. But I don't know if I would necessarily say that they're uh, going to be in a advantageous situation quite yet. They are going to get another turn in. It will only be threatening a four comparative to a keep on the side of Noventic. Uh, but it's going to be an uphill battle from this point on. But on uh, plus side to this is King of Blade Alpha is now slowly getting to the point where their composition is very threatening comparative to that of Neventic. Right. I mean, sure, they're down a level in experience, but this turn in does. It's their first turn in, in the game. That's yeah. a big deal for them. They did lose a keep. That's that's rough. That's for sure. But they're slowly trying to creep back on into this game. The problem being is half a level before we have Team Noventic at level 16. Yeah, and that's one of those situations where that 20 coins that they have is pretty much going to be useless until they fall on even footing. By that time, roughly, uh, you'll see that they'll be at 16. But yes, their opponents will be at 17 trying to make it to the race to 20. But a pick on the upper half of the map, Collusion trying to force the fight here. Is it going to be enough? Brightwing's not going to be able to TP quite yet here, oh. Jake. This is very risky. Beautiful condemn with that disintegrate of Li Ming doing a ton of damage. Look how low that... Uh, Lunar is in the pack. We do see a huge orb going out from Fan. A big force ball and a two-man maw followed up. Erho looking to follow up on this. The Bailings are in place, but we do see Tomster able to back on out of there. He is alive. Zuna looking for the Ancient Spear. Disintegrate already off cooldown, but not quite enough damage. In a beautiful force ball there from Talking Trees, but Zuna continuing in on the approach. 16 tier advantage is a J uh, for Neventus, so it wouldn't be, or Neventic, excuse me, so the, the chase there is not surprising at all. He does take the healing there at seven, which is keeping him up a little bit. They're going to stack a lot of the coins, try and turn in while they have 16 tier advantage, and their opponents are down a man. Meanwhile, Giants are threatening the bottom keep, but it's not going to be doing too much here. Slowly but surely, they're going to be trying to make something happen, but Neventic now has enough to turn in, and it's going to be a very hard game here. This will be threatening the top keep now at this point. Once that falls, the bottom keep will be very susceptible as well, because the front wall is down, and 
It's just one of those things where the map objective is so influential on this map, and even though Noventic doesn't have that big of a lead, structurally their lead is so huge that it's going to be very hard to see uh, Koba come back here. They need, they're need they still working on 16, and when they do, it's going to be rough. Um, they're going to be taking, again, a disadvantaged fight. So the last two to three minutes in this game, Lunara has left her Wisp at the boss, just yes. really watching the boss. Do you think that's a worthwhile use of the Wisp? Do you think they should be trying to you know move it around a little bit more frequently? It's one of those situations where it's kind of useful, but on Black Arts Bay, um, most of the time, you either know your opponent's turning in or you know they're bossing, so it will kind of remove that situation for them. I think they definitely could be min-maxing it a little bit more efficiency, efficiently, right? But I don't think... I don't want to say that it was poor play by any means. I just okay. feel like they could be using it at different areas for sure because the the uh, boss is pretty predictable for the most part when it comes to this map. And I don't think you're going to see Noventus uh, try and concentrate that because the boss honestly isn't that influential on this map. Turn-ins are way, way, way more important. Well, two keeps are down, and the third and final keep of King of Blades Alpha is weak, but level 16 has been achieved. And this is when Lunara starts to become quite a threat in the late game, just the long drawn out fights, especially with double support. If they're able to get in those situations and maybe get an early pick onto that Li Ming, King of Bleeds Alpha can definitely bring it back. This is crucial. Um, so not only does this fight, obviously it's very important because both teams are on even footing. Whatever team wins gets 15 coins, which is a turn in for both sides. So they essentially give up a turn in no matter what, but look how split they are right now. Uh -oh. Koba is completely separated from each other Ooh. in the four versus five. Great mod here, Jake. This is going to be a risky team fight. Yeah, Collusion is getting burned down. They swap the Disintegrate over the single target with the flank there from Frozen X on Lunar doing a lot of damage. They're turning it around. We do see the nice Divine Shield used to keep Zuna standing. The Holly going out, and that is going to be a dead early in this fight. Tomster in the back, trying to go back and in with that with that wolf form. Gets the kill. They're turning around. King of Blades might have this, but Fan trying to snowball with Li Ming. Doing so much damage from afar, and there goes Lunara. The resets are going to get more kills here. You need to watch out for another W, but Li Ming's actually oom at this point. So this is a really risky situation. The coin's favor did stay on the side of King of Blade Alpha, but they're going to lose a lot of the chest. Their opponents get the bottom half. This is so, so risky. So now, not okay. So this is a situation where they're not getting both of the ch chests. Um, they're going to give up both of the chests. So oh, no. They didn't. <laughs> their opponents went bottom. Naventic got bottom. But King of Blade Alpha backs out um, and doesn't try and capitalize on getting top chests. So, yes, they did keep a majority of those coins in their favor. But they actually ran into a situation to where they weren't able to essentially trade the coins in that situation. I really would have liked to see that out of them. And... Honestly, that was really well done on their part. That's the first time we saw a pretty even footing team fight coming out from them. And King of Blades Alpha finally showing life in their composition. Not so much because of a misplay, but just their comp was so, so late game, right? They finally hit that point, And you saw they put up a very good team fight against Noventic. And I just want to point out the fact that they were like trying to burn Li Ming at one point in that fight. And the power of Diamond Skin it was, just was really shown off there. Like so much of that Lunara damage was absorbed by the shield every time Li Ming decided to teleport. Yeah. And and she's gotten essentially full tank build, if you will, when it comes to Li Ming. Yeah. She has a maximum value there. Brightwing staying off to the sides to try and min-max the XP. Wisp going again to the top of the map to ensure the fact that they aren't getting bossed on. And again, the winner of this team fight, look how many coins are on the line for this fight. 36 coins between these two teams. Okay. If a full five wipe top happens here, Jake. Oh, barely doesn't get the turn in. We see Neventic able to just pressure them off the point. That is a big win, but yeah, 21 to 17. I mean... Neventic really doing a great job collecting as many coins as possible, initiating with the Shrink Ray there on Greymane, but the follow-up, the peel is successful. Poly used very early in but this the battle. Turn in. They're going to oh back no. away from the situation. Oh, no, they didn't complete the entire turn in there, so this is going to be a risky fight Whoa. here. Urho needs a Divine Shield to stay alive, but a massive Maw. They're getting in position. The Kadem used a little bit early, a mistake, but it doesn't even matter. Shredding through the health bars, the reset there on Li Ming, getting another kill, once again resetting, and that will be a turn in. This is a game point situation for Neventic. If they lose too many, it's going to be game. It's not even going to be a turn in. Yeah, you're going to rotate them in. They're going to end the game right now. They aren't even going to waste their time with the turn in. The turn in will not confirm the kill. They're going to rotate in. Neventic going to ensure the fact that they are going to walk away with this game. And honestly, it came all down to how well they played that last team fight. That four-man maw coming out of McIntyre was single-handedly the reason that momentum yeah. swing came into their favor there. So really well done in his part here. And Neventic is going to walk away here with game number one on Blackheart's Bay of all maps here, Jake. Not a common first map, and what a decisive end to that with that Maw. Well played by Neventic. Pretty close game, though. Big props to King of Blades Alpha. I mean, they had great decision making. They knew how to turn yeah. it around. They, the, the flanks we saw from Lunara a few times in that situation, like, worked brilliantly, keeping them in the game. Yeah.
but not quite enough. They just couldn't stop the gem collection of Neventic. I, I definitely don't think that that game was like, wow, Neventic just blatantly was so high in skill above their opponents that there was no chance. I right. feel like a lot of it was just comp and small early game decisions led them into a situation where considering the map, they just didn't have what it took. It took, excuse me, and then it all it took was like legitimately that whole game came down to like, Okay, well, your comp can't really deal with the early game, so they're going to turn in, they're going to snowball. Oh, you're finally on even footing? One team fight was all it was, and it was like, okay, you guys clumped up one time with a godlike maw coming out from McIntyre, and you lost it, and that lost you the game. I didn't feel like it was like, oh, man, there was three to four team fights, and Neventic was winning, so it's like, I definitely, I'm not going to sit here and say that I don't think King of Blades can't take the second game. I think they just needed to learn from maybe some of the mistakes when it came to the draft. That's entirely possible. I mean, it definitely a good effort. Maybe they'll draft a little bit differently, but that puts Neventic up 1-0 here in round one of the group stage. Of course, we have our highlights here. You see that Maw just securing the kill on Tassadar and points. a lot of the huge. coins picked up, right? This is the second turn in there for Neventic. Now moving much later into the game, level 16 even fights. This is when we do see they're collapsing here in the bottom. You see Zuna trying to bully Lunar in the top. The two-man Maw for the follow-up. I mean, every single time we see McIntyre throw at Maw. It gets a good presence on the fight, but the flank here from Frozen X really pressuring them nicely. The Divine Shield to really make sure Zuna gets out, but Urho left for the Wolves gets picked apart here from Tomster, who then overcommits and loses those six gems in just a moment. Going on into this fight, will be chased down in a moment. The resets there on leaving the power of that hero. Yeah. She's I mean, it's crazy. The amount of power that she has is just insane. They're getting the resets there, fan. The only reason he didn't snowball harder, but here is going to be it. McIntyre <laughs> with the huge maw. The follow-up, the condemn, like you said, coming out a little bit early, but it doesn't matter. Look at Zuna. He goes in. He's like, I'm going to spend a win. And then from that point on, you see them spread out, trying to ensure the kills, the fact that they can walk away from the game there, Jake. So just really well done, and I yeah. feel like a lot of it came down to comp. It really did. It really showed off just the power. I mean, even in situations where it looked, it did 47,000 damage. That's kind of an awesome fact that we get stats, you know, right after the game like yeah, that. Yeah, no, it's impressive. He was only rivaled by about one other hero in the game. That Tomster and Greymane and uh, Fan were the only ones above him. I got to say, though, I really liked Tomster and Greymane because I he agree. was getting the kills. I mean, he was making the plays happen. I, I definitely agree with you. If even you saw that last fight, for instance, uh, during that highlight reel, that situation to where you were complimenting McIntyre for his mod. It wasn't the four man, but the one directly before that that fight was where Lunara decided to isolate from the rest of her team and instantly Neventic was like guys they can't fight this like this so they decided to force that team fight and then you saw Lunara come in for the flank and almost be able to turn it around but largely that was great man he hit legitimately I think three to four Big five leaves. man cues yeah. that confirm the kills for them so really well done in his part he is definitely going to be something that sets his team apart here Jake well, we'll see if they can bring it back. We are setting up game number two here, and we're about to find out which battleground we're going to. It sounds like we're actually going to be on Dragonshire Dreadnought. This is my favorite map, and I'm really excited to see where these teams go. I do fear that this is another map that if King of Blades Alpha does not understand what directly they're going for in the draft, they could lose, not directly in the draft, but it's like you have that one moment where it's like, here's our time to take the game, and if you lose it as hard as they lost last game, it will cost you legitimately the entire game. Yeah, it's all about rotations. Vision is critical. Will we see the same kind of bans on Thrall? It's very possible. I, I mean, I think the Thrall ban is something you could see come out from, uh, uh, excuse me, from Neventic. Uh, yeah, some of the bans will be a little bit the same. The comps will be separated as well. Um, they won't be as common. For instance, false set, something that I, I, you heavily will see in this draft. Oh, with Largely Epic Mount? Because, yeah, with oh, Epic man. Mount and the flight. He's a great sustained DPS. He's not a must-have, but he definitely accents this map far better than he does on some of the other maps there. So I wouldn't be surprised to see that coming off from there. Other than that, I think um, if, uh, depending on Neventic and what they're wanting to get, how bold they're wanting to get today, I still feel like um, Chen's an option on this map. We do see the solo laner that he can do, Zagara. Um, there's a lot here, but here they go. They're going to move into the draft. King of Blades Alpha now going to be in that first pick situation here, Jake. Once again, game two on Dragonshire with Team Neventic up 1-0. The first ban on the side of King of Blades. Probably not going to be Rhaegar. They just want to try to force out Neventic into banning that hero. He's the highly, highest priority hero in the game for most situations just because of how flexible he is, even with multiple nerfs still has a huge presence in the North America meta. Absolutely. Uh, Falstad, Zagara, there's the ban on Zagara, so I wouldn't I like be surprised a for a first pick, Falstad. What that does, though, is it cripples their top lane. Mm -hmm. It doesn't make it... 
Uh, how do I say this? It doesn't make it to where their Ooh. top lane is useless. See, they ban out another top laner, so now they're going to pick on the false stat, but then uh, I wouldn't well, be Rhaegar. surprised. What about Rhaegar? They, they, that's what they're essentially calling them out. Yeah. It's like it, we've seen this twice today where the other team goes, all right, well, you choose. You pick one of the strongest heroes in the game or you lose out on that really, really like risky one type of damages, right? So like um, uh, false stat that he can provide here. So yeah, there's the Rhaegar. I wouldn't be surprised to see uh, kind of just like the false stat mixed with any other decent top laner at all because both the top laners have been removed and makes other top laners um, a lot more relevant. Sonya um, and as I said before, even I'd be willing to say the Chen here, Jake. Oh, don't get me too excited, Red. Well, we'll find out in Eventic. Two picks here before we move on. They're considering their options. Falstead with the global presence has a huge impact, but they're going for Li Ming. Will they pair Li Ming with her sister, Jaina? Well, they're not related in any shape or form, but I'd like to say they are. <laughs> Sonya's going to be picked up there. That uh -huh. was, uh, like I said, Sonya's going to be higher contested for these two teams. And I think with the removal of Thrall, um, it's going to be really big on their half. And it's crucial with the Rhaegar. Um, I would say that you could look out for, like, an Illidan, but the map is too small. Remember, you were asking whether or not we think Illidan's going to be coming into play. On the bigger maps, yes, this would be a prime situation. Really? Just Tass Illidan. It's, it's very, very hard to deal with in any type of situation there. But the map being so tiny, I would like to see them pull away from it there. And it does look like what you're going to see. ETC going to be the first time he's played, second time he's going to see play today, I believe. The Moonmaster. Um, and then Jaina for that great wave clear in the 1-4. Okay, well, Jaina seeing some play here with ETC. Just a well-rounded draft from King of Blades Alpha so far, not showing their hand quite yet. Now going into the next band, Team Deventic will be banning first. Considering they don't need to ban a support, what would they be worried about? More of those, maybe a frontline hero, Zeratul or something? Um, I think it's going to come down to whatever DPS they don't want their opponents to face. I think Zeratul is an option. I wouldn't be surprised to see it. I think Neventic's in a situation where they're not going to ban things that they necessarily are afraid of meta-wise. They're going to do a, like, what is just something crazy they could do to beat us? Like, we saw the Abathur last time, right? True. It's common. Zeratul is a character who can win all like every game just one void prison is all it takes and it's one of those things where at least when i was playing competitive that i would ban out just out of like i i think i'm better than this opponent and it, the only way they can win is if they have such an influential hero like zeratul but instead they say no they're going to look for the lunara they struggled with the last game and say that's too much i wouldn't be surprised king of blades to move towards like a tacitar style ban but uh, there's a lot of options Okay, well, they're they're thinking about their next option. They tr could try to lock them out of one of those big warriors like Muradin, but there's still Muradin stitches. You know, e ETC has been taken, but everyone else is still available. Could just be a assassin band. They know how efficient McIntyre is on fall stat, especially when you have Zuna playing a hero like Sonya going in. Sometimes he just he saves the Zuna feed from happening before it can be a thing. Absolutely, and it's a situation where they're going deep into their pool here. I'm um, trying to figure this out, really. I'm, I'm interested to see what I, they're... I just looked over my shoulder to make sure Zuna didn't hear me about saying uh, Zuna feed. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm no, good, no, I'm I, good, I, I'm safe. I'd be afraid of him. <laughs> That's tough. Morales, Morales. holy yeah. cow. Uh, no, not what I expected. Um, interesting. I don't know where that's actually kind of going. Their murder going to be locked in rather swiftly here uh, from Noventic. Any kind of pairing with the Sonya that they can get. They go with the Greymane instead. All right, so they have... Um, they have two options for the solo lane now. They have Sonya and Greymane. Sonya, I would say, is probably a little bit more dominant. Um, it comes down to what they think their better four man is going to be. And I honestly don't know enough directly when it comes to the Greymane on whether or not he will be the better four man. I think, right. I think personally, I like Sonya better in the solo. Um, enough to where I would justify putting Greymane in the, so in the four. But it is a good question here. King of Blade Alpha now. How are they going to respond? Their top laner, who's it going to be? Rhaegar has an option. But he's not necessarily the best. Tassadar is an option too, but not necessarily the best. Doesn't fit their composition that well. All right, Tehran, they're, they're go going for double supports. That could that could be saying we want to put Rhaegar in that lane, and they're going to look for a little bit more rotations. But what hero would complement for the stuns? Kalefoss hasn't seen a lot of play. I mean, yes, he has a good stun, but I don't know if he fits here. Yeah, I definitely don't think I would look towards KT. Um, I just feel like they already have a mage. That's not what I'd like to see. I personally would like Falstead. Um, I think the global on this map, there it is. They're going right. to lock in the false stat. Um, uh, now <laughs> the world is their oyster here when it comes to the last picks here. What support are they going to want? Is it going to be solo Tassadar? Are they going to make that risk there? They picked the gray main. They denied a little bit of the poke. False stat doesn't provide that much poke. The hard engage is exactly what they want to see out of King of Blade, but they say, nope, they're going to lock in the Uther. 
Well, they do have that get out of jail for free card with Divine Shield for both Sonya and Greyman when they decide to go ham or go home. That'll help them get home. And uh, it's just a lot of damage for their team in general. The burst potential as they dive in with the Leaming follow-up, if she gets those resets, this style of play can be absolutely devastating if you get those early kills. Yeah, no, I 100% I agree with you there. And a lot of it, what I'm worried about when it comes to this game is how well is King of Blades Alpha going to be able to deal with the 1-4? Uh, specifically, the 1 is what I'm a little bit afraid of. I just feel like they're in a situation to where I don't see how they're going to deal with that top lane. They're either going to struggle with the top lane or they're going to struggle with the 4-man. And Naventic is an experienced enough team that I don't think the etc Toronto combo is going to be that crippling. Obviously, it's good against every level of play, but I don't think it's going to be enough to really justify the suffering that they're going to see in the upper lane. Well, they are getting ready, guys. This is game number two. We can see you guys can actually vote on Twitter by using the hashtag HGC and either hashtag Neventic or hashtag KOB. Let us know who you think will advance here. Obviously, King of Blades could use some extra love. So if you're a King of Blades fan, make sure to voice your opinion over on Twitter. This is currently a 1-0 advantage for Neventic. And in a lot of people's minds, they are the favorite for this entire tournament. But let's take a look at who's playing who. We're going to have Fan, once again, going to be playing that Lee Ming. He did very phenomenal last game there. We're going to have Kenma is going to be on the Uther. Sonya will be played by Zuna once more. McIntyre is going to be on that Grey main this time. And Urho is going to be playing the Muradin. And Talking Trees will be on Toronto with Collusion playing ETC. Rhaegar going to be played by Dark Chimera. Frozen X on Falset and Tomster played by Jaina. But we're ro rolling into game number two on Dragonshire here. The second here in round one between the Ventic and King of Blades Alpha. Absolutely. And what I, like I said, I'm really worried about what the top lane decision making is going to be here. Again, the level one is going to be won by the ETC Toronto. It typically is. Anytime there's a Toronto, one through nine is going to be won by that team. So the head to head here, um, I wouldn't be surprised if it went in favor of King of Blades. But again, the top laner is so, so worrisome. If they do win team fights, though, that fall stat is going to be a crucial point in their success when it comes to obtaining the Dragon Knight. All right, well, it looks like all 10 members will just run down this mid lane to clash their heads and slam them into each other to try to do a little bit of damage. Generally speaking, this usually results into a disengage, but the early priority here in the mid lane is because those minions will make it to the center before the minions in the top and bottom lane. Yeah, and they're just uh, kind of dancing it out a little bit here. Uh, the wave clear isn't going to be that um, dominant for either of the teams quite yet. ETC getting caught out a little Ooh. bit there, and it might be... Uh, it's not going to happen too much. The great Ross done there on wow. McIntyre. That's going to cost fight. him his life. That is one dead wolf. Really well done. The Ross done from Trees <laughs> and Urho now as well. <laughs> the wolf, the feral lunge, and a quick two for nothing there for King of Blades Alpha. A great start. That power slide we saw for ETC down to hit Greymane just barely. And that's like, I don't know, that's one of those situations where I just feel like that might have been Neventic kind of biting off a little bit more than they could chew. We, I mean, it's pretty apparent when you see the Toronto. You're like, well, does my level one actually compete with their opponents and the answer is pretty much usually no and so uh, the raw stun was all it took and they walk up with a 2-0 lead king of blades really just kind of saying hey we might have a chance here we're going to try and win this game here yeah and a beautiful start but from them they're going to be able to control this bottom shrine considering they have the stronger presence but no they're actually opting to back away realizing a rotation could be imminent here sonia would you see zuna going to control the top shrine for the time being and it's one-to-one -one even trades. It's one of these situations where we see the top lane is uh, going to be Sonya versus False. And I, there he is. He's going to be instantly Ooh. getting to the upper half of the lap. Map. Oh, nice. nice yeah, roll. Zuna mistiming a little bit on his Q there. Um, I, I don't think it would have been a kill either way, but uh, he does end up just barrel rolling out of there and surviving by quite a bit. The four man is now, because of that aggressive rotation, going to be slightly won on the side of King of Blades Alpha. But right now, it's kind of just a dance. Everybody making the rotation, trying to figure out what the best call is, and nobody really capitalizing on the false head one-on-one -on, -one on top. So they desperately need to nerf that ETC skin because it is the noisiest skin in the world, but it's okay. We do see Zuna is re really doing a great job bullying back Frozen X, and if he steps out, Kenma is just waiting. Yeah, it's an interesting situation where Falstead might not win the top lane, but because the rotations between Neventic are going between mid and top, mid and top, rather than the bottom, which you traditionally see, because keep in mind they don't have kill potential. Oh, ETC going to get the stun there, but it's not going to be enough. Toronto is going to lose her life for that. The two-man engage, but Kenma... 
But wow. gonna be cut out. Wow. Dean is gonna be wow. Thompson Mega presence, taking... huge damage yep. from Fan coming through as he teleports in and gets the reset. But we do see Collision able to back away before he gets collapsed on with the stuns and with False at flying up the top. That does give them control of both runs just for a moment. Now we have the quick rotations into either lane where we will see Neventic regain control of the map. Yeah, and that's just a situation where the ETC Toronto combo, you feel like you have the strong early game, but you forget that if you don't have that follow-up damage, you don't really have too much to do there, and they end up getting an instant pick there on two of the heroes. They're really well done on Aventic, understanding that they were isolated completely. Um, and what I was saying is, though, by not winning the top lane there with the, maybe that matchup, for say, uh, they're using Rhaegar on the bottom half to try and dictate the pace against Fan, and you see him getting a little bit aggressive, trying to dance around that as best they can. But Tom's are going to get the flank. Will Fan make it out here? I don't I don't think he will. That's going to be, yeah, he's going to be going down there really well done. But in the upper lane, he does survive as well. This is King of Blaze is honestly putting on a pretty good show so far with their Miranda comp. The question is, can they do that in the mid to late game? This gets much harder as the game goes on. Yeah, well, you know, leaming down for another five seconds. I want to talk about the Toronto build with Searing Arrows. I mean, this is very much a utility damage dealer support, right? Oftentimes, you see the Empower build with Sentinel going for Pearson and Power to get the reset and get more heals out, especially when you spec into the healing at level 13. But this style, it's really going to be about Lunar Bray, Blaze doing additional damage, resetting that Hunter's Mark and using it as often as you can. Very powerful style for her, for sure, especially paired with ETC. Absolutely. And uh, I just, it's one of those situations where uh, how this four man keeps going and whoever gets the deep first DK, I don't feel like they're going to give that big of a lead, but I do think that if they're on even footing for too long collusion with their kind of comp, their pick comp, here that goes on the bottom half of the map, it might be a struggle for them. Kemba looking to engage, but he might be too far. Ooh. Stun coming out. But he power slide by Kemba back oh. away, dodging the Lunar Flare. King of Blade Trees is actually very low, but able to retreat in this situation. The double support working out nicely, but collusion is going to go down. It's one of those situations where the struggling Zuna instantly on mid. Really well done on his part. Oh. So it's one of those situations where, remember when we were talking about losing that top lane? Um, if you end up losing that four man at the same time, Sonya is able to rotate as fast as possible to the middle half of the map, ensuring the fact that they're going to get a DK there, along with the picks. And Eventic showing off their skills right there. Really well done on his part. And you're going to see they're going to be patient with this DK. There is no reason to commit suicide and just go really hard in this front wall here. Be patient with it as best you can. Um, and really just force a split pushing there. You see Zuna's on top, but they're tri tri laning on bottom. The reason for that is going to min-max essentially the amount of XP they're able to yeah. get on their opponents. I mean, look at the damage fan can do from afar. Yep. Safe pokes, but the rotation here, we do see a lot of damage being dealt, but McIntyre with the Jukes gets out with that Dark Flight, and he's able to escape. Absolutely brilliant response there from McIntyre. Yeah, and uh, really big shout out to Kemba right there. That was really big cleanse in order to ensure like he had perfect reaction time in that type of situation. So, uh, and able to ensure that McIntyre is going to walk away there and again, Zuna dancing in the top lane with his patience, walks in the top uh, of top front wall and bottom getting half the front wall as well. Neventic's now ensured a half level lead, but in the mid lane. All right, Dwarf Toss will successfully get him out. A bit of a mistimed Lunar Flare there from the Tyrande, so they missed their opportunity. And Urho gets out unscathed. But we do see a lot of mercenary camps available. Just the one giant camp has been picked up so far in this game, I believe. But Team Neventic really closing in on their heroic abilities and especially pushing in like this. That will just about secure it. Yeah, and we see that they're backing out, uh, getting the giants here. They're going to siege up with these giants most likely and trying to ensure that their level 10 gets pushed as hard as it can. Whenever you get a 10 advantage over your opponents, you never want to just be like, okay, that's cool. You want to force the fight. And if you can't force a fight, then force an objective. Expect that they come out of Neventic here with the half level uh, that they still have before King of Blades Alpha makes anything happen here. There you go. A little bit of siege on the front wall there. Giants pushing on the bottom. And really, uh, they've established kind of dominance on this map so far. Even though they're facing an early game composition, they're the ones with the level lead here, Jake. All right. Yeah, I mean, they're really starting to push in. You mentioned those Giants in the bottom. Uther just kind of hanging out, trying to make sure they're as safe as they can be. Level 10 around the corner for King of Blades Alpha, working on getting their heroic so they can look to take a fight. No critical damage has been done during either the Dragonite or that heroic advantage. So I'd say that it is a nice win for King of Blades. And this is a situation where we're talking about the diversity of Li Ming. Look at her build compared to, uh, to the last game True. there. She's going to see, uh, the Seeker's going to see play now. Instead of that Calamity style play, um, she's going to be looking to get that poke wherever possible because she doesn't have a melee that's directly going to get onto her. Yes, you do have ETC Toronto, but is Calamity really going to be effective in that type of situation to save you? You're either dead or you're not. Barrel Roll going to come out there, and now these teams, um, are, I want to see King of Blades abuse their global here and try and be a little bit patient and then cap the top shrine a little bit later. Otherwise, I feel like they're going to express too much information and Neventic's really going to capitalize here. 
Okay, Jaina really thought about that heroic ability. Does opt to go for the water elemental. Now, in the fact that in the in the event we have a mage battle, that will be very useful. But Ring of Frost does have big implications with Mosh Pit. Zuna gets some light pressure. The hammering actually missing there, so Zuna will be able to just mount up and back on up, and then control this top shrine, evening it out one to one. And this is one of the situations because the night camps was timed properly. Now, uh, Neventix actually capitalized by getting both of the shrines at the exact same time, even though two of their um, uh, players from King of Blades Alpha were in the upper half of the map. They still lost the shrines there uh -oh. because of the wave being pushed. And now this is going to be a risky fight here in the mid lane. Uh, probably a five-man rotation for both teams. Here it is over this. Rhaegar still on bottom. Keep in mind, Jake. Yeah, Rhaegar is not going to be there for the Ancestral. And they actually sneak out the dragon. Very early fall side just gets burned down like he's nothing. And a desperate shadow stalk from Tirana just to keep Collusion alive. He taps the well. His health is fine, but they've already lost the hero and they lost the dragon. Yeah, that's a worst case scenario there. It was a four versus five. You could tell they didn't want to take the fight and then they didn't, but they also failed to appreciate the fact that Zuna came from the fog of war and just solo capped that there. Now 13 to advantage is going to be picked up. They're down a man here and really Neventic is honestly in a really good position. They're going to clear on mid, rotate to the bottom half of the map now, try and get bottom as best they can. Notice how again they're split pushing here. We see two people rotating to the upper half of the map and then uh, Zuna's rotating to the bottom half of the map. Really well done here, trying to min-max as best they can using these early DKs that aren't that good to capitalize and get as much as they can. Never committing too hard with the DK here. Yeah, I mean, just nice safe pressure in the bottom. Only 10 seconds remaining on that dragon and collusion is power sliding in. The Lunar Flare is successfully connecting there. We actually see Cleanse was used early in this fight on McIntyre, but collusion almost goes down, but the Gus is there at the last moment to peel for him. Well used there, 40 second cooldown. Always phenomenal for disengaging. Absolutely. They did end up using the disengage and keeping themselves alive, but they also lost bottom fort in the process, and the Merc camps are going to be up on the lower half of the map. I wouldn't be surprised for the capitalization, but oh my goodness, oh. that is one dead Jaina. The stun from Urho and the follow-up there. Fan securing the kill there, Jake. That was a bit out of position. I'm not really too sure. I mean, just really overstepping your bounds. Yeah, he was definitely trying to get a little bit too aggressive knowing his opponents were on the upper half of the map, but I feel like it's just kind of uh, King of Blades Alpha trying to make something happen um, with fear that this game is maybe going to snowball a little bit too out of their favor. And oh again, no, Frozen another prime ex example, the Gus coming out with right. that very low cooldown, but um, are they going to need that to keep somebody else's life later on a little bit up higher? And now the race is 16, severely being lost here. Um, is even a race at this point, Dreadnought? Three level uh, lead for a moment for Neventic. Two yeah. and a half realistically, but I mean, that is a sizable advantage 10 minutes into the game. It's, yeah, it's beyond sizable really at this point. So what you're going to see if I was Neventic in this situation, um, because you have 16 tier advantage this high over your opponents, you just cap giants. If they fight at all, you just try and kill them at 16. They are going to try and get the invade K. Wait till you get 16. Stack as many mercs on the lower half of the map as you possibly can together and just siege with them because your opponent has had so little things to be able to deal with that type of situation here. Okay, well, we do see the one merc camp does get picked up by King of Blades. Level 13 talents were just picked up by them. So, Giant Killer on False Side, phenomenal. We actually have, is that going to be Spirit Walker on Rhaegar? Um, on Rhaegar here, yes, it is going to be. I believe it is, yeah. It, no, oh, Tidal Waves, excuse me, for the 13 chains there, but Tom's are getting Ooh, caught out. Beautiful oh. Gust, and the Shadow Stalk barely getting Jaina out. That's actually a really big win for them to escape from that situation. It, it is, but it's like, I'd almost rather see King of Blades Alpha because of how the scaling stacks here, right? If they keep using Gust to disengage and barely survive, they're going to stay three levels behind. Yeah. It's actually a winning trade for them to just try and just one for one. Enemy every situation, instead of disengaging, just try to go one for one. Because right now, you are doing nothing to try and come back in this game. And here we see Collusion going to be picked out a little bit here. And the bottom shrine already won by Neventus. Ooh, huge Neventic. damage. The Ancestral Hill cannot connect McIntyre and Fan with a huge damage. Collusion going into the water. That is a cow drinking from the well. And Jaina will join him. <laughs> Yeah, and that's going to be a DK here over on the side of Neventic. I wouldn't be surprised um, um, if they're going to push it on mid or bottom. I personally would prefer bottom just because, again, the map objective, or uh, excuse me, the shrine's going to spawn in that lane. So it's the, one of the most valuable lanes to be pushing here. And not only that, then every one of the giants and most of the mercs go to that lane. There you go. Urho automatically rotating the bottom. Again, the prioritization of lanes very relevant here at the top level of play. Really good job here from them. And it's honestly Neventic's game to lose at this point. Um, yeah. Their composition is good in the later half of the game. Grey Mane's now hit a spike. Lee Ming's a very powerful hero. Um, Sony's great all around, and their opponents don't have that great of late game scaling, so I wouldn't be surprised if they're going to be able to maybe even get a couple picks here and maybe look to end now.
All right, well, so much damage being dealt from the Dragonite. He's just saying happy 20th birthday, Pokemon, as they knock on this keep. Dragonite's a great Pokemon. <laughs> he is a great Pokemon. And look at Collusion trying to make something happen Ooh. here. I, I honestly, I know you're like, well, they aren't 16. Like, why would you try and do that? But personally, like I said, I would like to see them try and take something and go one for one because if they aren't trying to capitalize on those type of situations, they're essentially doing nothing to try and make a comeback into this game. They do not directly outscale their opponents on most fronts. So. Um, really well done. I wouldn't be surprised after this Neventic back out of the DK, paint the map blue as best they can. I keep pressure and keep this up. It's a rinse and repeat at this point. It's it's King of Blades game to make a move. They're like, hey, we're how, far enough ahead that you have to make the drastic play, not us. Yeah, it's true. It's true. And we've just seen the, the big safe plays, you know, coming out left and right. The damage of Greyman at 16, post 16 with a uh, concentrated blast is just disgustingly strong. Paired with Mirror Ball, crazy, crazy burst damage if those two put their abilities in sync. Like you said, painting the map blue is exactly what's happening. The uh, We do see the Bruiser camp picked up there on the left side of Neventic, and now they're going to work on the bottom Bruisers to boot. Yeah, it's again that exact situation. You guys have to answer to us. And remember that prioritization of laning we were talking about? This is where it comes into play, guys. Look at Giant's going to be pressuring bottom lane, which has no keep. Knight's going to be pushing bottom lane, which has no keep. It's very crucial. And then you're like, well, that's not that important because they'll die to core. But guess what? That's the lane where there is going to be the shrine. And that lane with the shrine, oh, man. Look at him trying to make something happen here. Deventic actually looking to get a little bit too hypey, possibly, oh, but over man. the wall. Fan unleashing that disintegrate. There, okay, Jake. the gust goes out. Urho is still in, and that puts them in a bit of a dicey situation. But the self sustain is there. Lunar Flare and Hunter's Mark pick up the kill. But the huge damage from Fan over the wall. Ancestral Heal gonna top off one, but Trees cannot stay alive. No, barely sustaining through. But the Ancient Spear of Zuna takes out Rhaegar with trading ETC on the left side. Three for one for Neventic. That was a really good job on Fan's part, getting the blink to try and ensure that. That is almost likely, yeah, most likely uh -oh. going to be one dead Jaina here. Uther's mounted up. That is going to be it. She's going to fall apart here. And that's going to be four people dead. I, they might be looking to go to core. Or look no, at the, gonna look be the bottom lane. There's but no keep. There's huge marks. It's one of these things where it will actually die on the core, right? So it's not going to get that much. So they're going to inst instead be ensuring the fact that they get mid keep. Once they get mid keep, if they don't manage to get the picks, they'll just most likely back out, get a free DK, rotate through the bottom half of the map, get 20 tier advantage, and then look to end the wow. game. Again, it's just so, so, so hard to come back on this map if you don't make those aggressive plays that we need to see out of uh, King of Blades Alpha. Well, the shield is taking a good beating here, but the double catapults and giants should be cleaned up in time, especially with that minion wave spawning, so they will not take any structural damage, but they lost another keep, and they're about to lose these top towers. And that's like, you saw that camp pushing in the bottom half of the map. That's what I was trying to articulate with that prioritization of the lane. They now get free, look at top pushing. They see if anybody wants to contest top, they know. Anybody want to contest bottom, Neventic knows, so it's really their D okay to win, but oh, he they went to get the cap and the shield, shield came out. That was actually to ensure the fact that he gets the cap. Miscommunication yeah. on Neventic. All right, here, a lot of damage going there onto Urho. They actually got back, but Tyronic is picked in the back and the reset there. Fan is just going to town, shredding through their health. McIntyre diving in. The Dragonite will be picked up in the back of this. An ancestral hero, too little, too late. Frozen X and Jaina, the only two still alive. I don't think they can defend this. I, they definitely can at this point. That's going to be four people dead for 30 seconds minimum here, and there's going to be a 15-minute DK pushing on the core, and this is I mean, very good showing on the side of Neventic here. Um, they this game was played very, very well on all fronts. I mean, the score coming out to 16 to four uh, against a Miranda-style composition, not allowing any form of picks against them. Jake, really, really well done on the side of Neventic. But don't count King of Blades Alpha out. I really do feel like they put up quite good games here, and a lot of it comes down to a little bit of draft and maybe a little bit of nerves. Well, well played there by Neventic, a 2-0 victory in the first round of this tournament over their opponents, King of Blade Alpha. They will advance to the upper bracket finals here in Group A. Yep. Versus Tempo Storm. Versus Tempo Storm. Is, that's going to be a phenomenal matchup out of those two teams. And a lot of the hero prioritization that we saw be a little bit different in the first set. How is that going to change when they go possibly, or when they go up against Neventic here later on? I am absolutely excited to see how those matches are going to play out, specifically with kind of like Zeratul there. But um, there you go. You see the sportsmanship out of Neventic moving over there to give the handshake, the GGs, and uh, really well done on their part, Jake. And of course, while well, the King of Blades Alpha, they're not out of it yet. Nope. The next match is going to be King of Blades Alpha versus Panda Global.
Oh man, and that will be really good. Both of those teams, uh, I feel like, have a really good games up against each other. But here we see in the highlight reel here, really good level one. That the tempo of this game started so much in the favor. Look at that two picks. Erho going to be chased down here. The five man focus fire. Look at that out of them, um, out of this Jake. And then Thompson, the reverse here the in the early around. game. Yeah, the reverse. Lee Ming getting the resets there. Really well done on Fan. The snake DK from Zuna. Really well done. Man, Fan is just so beastly on that hero. He comes yeah. with those flames and he just blows you up and with gray main the the double power of those two new heroes really really just picking their opponents apart and you can see it here controlling all the mercenary camps controlling and dictating the power of the map to secure themselves these dragons that we saw on sonia a few times it's every time there's a kill it's fan fans involved yeah i mean he did it all game he was just like being very aggressive you saw him even get a blink in and then just ultimate up there but already well, we've got an interview here with Zuna. Take it away, Anna. Indeed we do. I am here with Zuna. And Zuna, you guys, there was a, a major catastrophe that happened right before you guys started playing, right before an event jumped into that match. What happened, Zuna? Uh, my glasses broke when I put on my headset, so I couldn't see with one eye. <laughs> and they were just kind of hanging off your face on one side, right? So you did this on hard mode, basically. How was that? Uh, that's why I fed game one. <laughs> <laughs> well, feeding game one as it may be, you guys did emerge 2-0. In terms of predictions, most people, because of the way things were seeded and because you qualified so early, people were assuming this might be that kind of match. Did this match go as you guys thought it would? Um, I think it went pretty well. I think more than anything, we're just getting the like jitters out of us, so we're not playing as good as we should, but I feel we'll play better later the day comes. You guys have been around. I mean, you guys are no newcomers to this scene, but your team is kind of a new thing. You just recently got picked up by Noventic. How does that feel? How has the organization changed things? It, uh, it, it helps a lot, actually, because you have lots of stress when you're playing for, like, nothing pretty much. So having someone that will back you and just release a lot of stress just helps. Well, you did an awesome job one-eyed either way. And uh, Casters, what do you think about that, him playing with, with only one eye this time? I had no idea that was the case during that, and you know, I, I, I saw, mean, I didn't either. That was, I mean, that's pretty impressive. That's all I got to say about that. <laughs> it's just I can't imagine playing with one eye. So let's talk about Sonia. I mean, you guys, you prioritize Sonia quite a bit in that draft. Do you think she's really got a strong place? Because in North America, she doesn't seem all that common overall. Um, I think it just came down to we didn't want to reveal too many strats, and like Sonia's just a strong hero, so we felt like as long as we had a strong core, like three heroes, then it didn't really matter too much. It definitely seemed that way, I feel like, for the most part. Um, from our perspective, is just understanding that you guys have that kind of confidence and that you were going to walk in just, like, knowing that she's such a good hero and just not revealing anything. And do you feel like, overall, that you're, how long do you think you're going to be able to keep that up? At what point do you think you're going to hit the point where you're like, maybe we have to do something? I feel like it's going to come down if we feel we're either going to lose or it's the matches to go to Korea. Okay. You guys will be moving on to face Tempo Storm. How do you think that match is going to go? I think it'll go good for us, but you never know with Tempo Storm. They're they're pretty random. Like some games when they play on fire, they're really hard to beat. But other games, you just you have question marks. Well, unfortunately, I have to wrap it up. But I did want to mention I um I heard your motto repeated to me backstage, and your motto that you wrote down was "Eat big, bleep big, poop big, live big." Uh, did you do that in this match? And if so, how so? Um, not too much, but I. I, I don't really like to eat before games, so I really couldn't do of any of it. Okay, well, maybe next time. <laughs> Guys, we're going to see you very, very soon. The next match is going to be Panda Global versus King of Blades Alpha. Don't go anywhere.